Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem Iskander. Hey, everyone, Matt DiNapoli here. Welcome to episode 154 of Stack Minute. And uh, this week we have Flo Pockinger uh, joining us again. Uh, he always brings the, the thunder when he comes on, and he's going to be talking about um, Gen AI stuff uh, and something you guys are probably trying to figure out right now, which is RAG. And we're going to do it all with uh, Cisco Catalyst Center to really kind of dig into how we can tie some Gen AI activities into automation. Um, specifically with Cisco. So really excited to, to have you on, Flo. Um, for the newbies in the in the room, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, and then we'll jump right into it. Uh, sure, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm Flo Paching, I'm a developer advocate, and for now I have the honor and the uh, cool thing to uh, focus on generative AI, um, various architectures and the code, uh, together with uh, Cisco product. Flo, so tell us a little bit about what the use case that you're uh, you put together here uh, for our snackers and, and, uh, I'd like to learn like a little bit as to why. Yeah, sure. No, <laughs> rag on a cat 9k. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I love to hear this, uh, this question. So imagine this use case. So if you are, would like to have a specific API call out of Cisco catalyst center. So if we look at the documentation here on the left side, uh, you can see, uh, let's choose maybe topology and then get the, uh, the VLAN details. And then we say like, you need to go into the documentation. You need to uh, create your Python code there. However, you can do it with generative AI and create your own assistant. So I will switch to the code and just start this assistant here. And then we basically just type in get VLAN details. So we would like to have the API REST call of Catalyst Center and get VLAN details there. So we will ask the LM and uh, to generate the Python code, to generate like how, what kind of API re requests are needed. And here you go. You have already a full example on with the correct VLAN names, like the correct um, API REST API call. You have here a fully functioning Python code there as well with uh, where you can get your token, your DNA center, catalyst center token, and all the whole functions there. And if we check it with the, um, with, on the documentation, it basically is the same. So you will save a lot of time, of course, because you see here that, um, bam, you have already like the whole function, the whole information there. You just need to copy paste it and then use it in your, in, in your code or in your scripts there. So that makes sense. Um, so the interesting part for me is kind of how you generate, um, this response and kind of the tool chain behind it. Um, can you dig into how the assistant was built and how you leverage RAG to, to make this work? And what were the limitations of the LLM that you would have to use RAG? Sure, like that's a good one because uh, some people might say, um, you can just use uh, ChatGPT or other tools like in order to do that. But the cool thing is here actually that this is actually code which is used or the latest uh, documentation and latest API specification. And how you can do that is with RAG. So I will just scroll down here so like, you see here, like there is a, a repository there. There, are, I created even a video there um, on on the specific um, uh, function. So, like uh, on, on on this project there, uh, there's a YouTube video and even a learning lab. But let me just go through. Like I have a scroll down. I have here a summary on how Rag actually uh, works there. So basically, uh, you are here the user now, and the user is asking for assistance. For example get a list of all network devices, or for example, get uh, me all the VLAN names. So the user querying the specific Python application, and the query is then vectorized um, into, um, like, uh, into numbers, uh, into vectors, and then basically the, the vector DB is doing a specific semantic search against this user query. And here in this Chrome uh, like DB I use, this is like uh, one vector database, what you can use. This is uh, basically creating or uh, comparing the context information um, and the context information regards to get the VLAN details, get the, uh, the correct um, API specification calls and so on. And then the, the user query and this context information, what the Chroma database gave uh, this Python application is then put into the large language model. And this is the cool thing because now the large language model is not dealing with uh, like old data. It's actually dealing with uh, really like the latest data. So I'm putting here the latest version, latest API specification of Catalyst Center. And then it's creating out of this information, 
their specific Python code and is adding the documentation to it. So there's two interesting things I'd like to one ask and then also point out here. So uh, the the thing that you've put into Chroma DB, or I should ask I should ask this question. Um, you had to populate Chroma DB with the latest um, API documentation for Cattle Center, correct? Right, exactly. So I have the process here actually above there. So this is the the inferencing part basically. And if you are going more into the data part, because as you pointed out correctly, you need to put it first data into the Chroma DB, into the vector database. So in this example, I put actually three data sources into the Chroma DB. So you can see here on one side, there is the user guide, which is the 900 pages PDF file. Um, then this pages or this guide is getting chunked. So which means uh, per, per, uh, per page, for example. And then again, this page, this one page is getting again embedded. So which means vectorized, like put from characters into numbers and then inserted into the Chroma DB. And the same happened with API documentation. So that it will be, they will be web grabbed uh, um, to a text. Then again, it will be chunked. And the same thing happens. You need to, like the uh, LM doesn't understand basically um, like characters as, as, we, as, key, as key characters. So it need, we, we need to put these specific characters into numbers. And then the LM can basically uh, check, okay, what is the semantic um, relationship to the data and uh, then it can basically um, uh, like predict. Okay, what is the next? What is the next um, number of of of, um, of the sentence, for example? And last but not least, the API specification. So I put there a specific uh, the classic API specification what we releasing like from Catalyst Center, um, and then I extended this API um, information or this API specification with actually a large language model. So I am creating new data with the large language model to extend it um, and then uh, and then insert it into the uh, Chroma, uh, Chroma DB into the vector database. So I, th this is one thing I wanted to call out as part of using LLMs, because this was something that I kind of misunderstood at the beginning of, of uh, <laughs> at the beginning of all of this, <laughs> was that the LLMs themselves, um, for the most part, uh, the ones that we interact with are, are static. Um, and so the, the dynamism in using them comes from um, being able to set up pipelines to ingest new data and that's where rag comes into play and this was a, a, a kind of a mind-blowing thing for me in understanding how all of these tool chains work because i just assumed the large language models were were constantly updating and and i think if that were the case the world would explode <laughs> so that's probably um or we'd <laughs> run out of compute power in about a, a day and a half so um that's where that this understanding of rag really really hit and it's very specifically flow this this example really nailed it for me so um, i wanted to call that out specifically for our um our audience here who might be just kind of starting into the space to understand that these large language models they're not um you know black boxes and they definitely have have limitations that we can work around and this is an example of working around that for a specific use case and that, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for clarifying that. Actually, I was, I was, um, I knew you had to like, you had to, it wasn't auto updating. The LLMs don't auto update. You had to actually be intentional about it. The, the part that I, and I apologize if I missed this flow is, is where's the, are you, are we deploying all of this as a container on top of the cat 9k or the catalyst, or am I misunderstanding this? Uh, no, no worries, Karim. So, like, this is actually a good, a uh, good question there. Okay, where, where to deploy it? So, we have here what I showed before the uh, rag, like the inferencing part. So, you need to host uh, the uh, LM uh, somewhere. So, what uh, I, I show, showcase it here. So, what you could use is you could basically use like um, a cloud service where the LM is basically sitting in the cloud and sending data to the um, uh, to OpenAI to, for example, to Azure. Uh, or to AWS and then get the response back from their uh, language model. But you can also um, basically use a local service. So for example, with um, Olama or various like uh, as, an, uh, s s as a local service uh, and using uh, open source models like Llama 3, Llama 3.1, uh, Mistral. Um, so these kinds of large language models which you host um, basically locally. Um, but for that, um, as of now, like how this um, 
example is basically created, you would host this now on a UCS server with a GPU, for example. Or when you have like a small language model, uh, you can um, host it as well on uh, on a laptop, for example. There are, of course, some specific uh, services or LMs, like SLMs, like small language model, where you could actually host the small language model on the Catalyst. But it, it really depends on the uh, large language model or the small language model, how powerful it is. So this always this needs to be tested as well. I understand. So that it, it's the 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 Canon K or whatever it is that you choose to host on is just acting as a hosting service essentially. It's not it's not getting you it's not giving you anything new as far as auto updating that that small language yeah. model or anything because it's connected to your network. Right. Well, and this is the Catalyst Center portion of this is generating automation for Catalyst Center without having to necessarily know Python, right? You're depending on the large language model in this instance to put in the Python expertise right. and the Chroma DB vector base to add in the, the Catalyst Center API flavor coming from the documentation. And we're itself. saying it's, you also have the ability in order to, you can, we have the capability to be able to host this on top of your potentially, yeah. Potentially, if it's yeah. if this footprint's small enough, right? <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, now I get it. Um, okay. Sorry for being that. No, no, no. You, I mean, those are those are great questions, and this is one of the things I think where people are tentative in adopting some of these tool chains or even understanding how to oper operationalize them is saying, "Well, I already can write in this Python application. Why do I have to add extra steps into it?" Well, your network engineers might not be super comfortable in writing Python code or Ansible or Terraform. This is potentially s s shallowing out that ramp for adding in uh, automation into your into your infrastructure. And hopefully, <laughs> um, there's a, a set of experts within your organization that can understand where the RAG portion comes in and the, and the LLM or SLM come in in this instance. Um, but it is kind of a quick and easy way to learn this stuff without actually having to dig through the documentation and read, uh, learn Python the hard way and all that stuff. And so it's it's helpful in that instance, right? It definitely removes the, the friction of having to understand how you formulate your Python and your, your, your requests when it comes to, like the documentation is great for Catalyst Center, but there are some convoluted calls that you need to to supply a bunch of data as part of the body. And that data is super finicky. So like being able to get that automated mm -hmm. based on the information that you supply it from your network, I think it's it's super powerful. Yeah. And and for this particular example, um, you know, we're using publicly accessible information. So it's possible that the LLM already has this and we wouldn't need to do RAG necessarily. But when you're starting to use this within your operations and you want to keep things private, yeah. <laughs> the LLMs that are open source, I mean, they're 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 going to know the auspices of Python, but they're not necessarily going to understand the Cisco part of it, right? Um, so that's where when we start to think about operationalizing these things and using them, um, then that's where you know we got to be very cagey about using the public services available to us because it is public, and we want to be very careful not to from an enterprise standpoint, share right. the secret sauce. So it's crazy. It's a, it's a whole new, real bold new world. I just wanted to add there that it's like, that's the cool thing about RAG is because there you own your data still. So even if you send the short like um, context of data, um, you basically know what goes out because you know, you put the data in the vector database. So you basically put your own data into the vector database and you can uh, decide and basically um, um, like uh, have the authority um, to put only specific data what you like um, um, to the LM. So I have also like an, another example here where um, you basically um, can extend this uh, example into get me a list of all devices and export this list as a spreadsheet locally and include the authentication function. So here we are here we are adding actually um, that uh, we would like to like export the data as a spreadsheet. And if we um, like use this assistant now, you would usually go ahead and of course um, check the REST API code, the Python uh, Python code, and then also like how to import it into the C or convert it into the into a CSV file. So here again we have um, uh, the the documentation where. At first, we do the authentication. We get the uh, the token from uh, Cisco Catalyst Center. 
we get a device list here. And then finally, we are actually converting it into a CSV. So here we have the function get the token. We have here get the device. And finally, we are exporting devices into a, a CSV file, which means like into a spreadsheet locally. And, and here we go. And here we have the device. So we just need to copy paste the Python code. And here is, uh, here is the output. And that's kind of the cool part because you can extend your use cases there. Um, and just one thing what I would like to see, and maybe some people are interested. So like, how does the, the prompt look like where, what we send to the LM, I still have this, uh, here in the, um, in, in the code, basically in the, uh, in the output. So in the log files, you basically see here, the, um, the specification. Let's start in the bottom. So here we have the user question, get me a list of all the devices. And on top of it, you see the API context, like here in this XML text. And this is actually all the information, what the, what you put out or what the uh, semantic search give, um, um, uh, uh, put out there. And these are the specific documents. So this is actually parts and snippets from the uh, documentation, what is in the vector database. So this is bunch of text, of course. And here it closes, like this is API context closes. And then again, another context um, is done. Like this is the API specification context. And here we have another context from the web documentation. Again, these are a bunch of documents. Um, and uh, then this is about it, right? Like here, we send the context information two times, plus also the specific um, like query, the user query. And then we, uh, we see the output, um, what the LM is creating out of all of this, uh, co code and, and data, what it receives here. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Flo, unfortunately we are running out of time. Um, I think maybe <laughs> we should try and have you back to dig a little bit deeper into the implementation side of it. So people can kind of understand the nuts and bolts of kind of the end result we showed, we, we showed you the cake, um, coming out of the oven, but maybe it'd be worth uh, seeing how the batter's made. So and snackers for the snackers that are interested in trying this out flow, you said this is uh, on the DevNet uh, GitHub as well as there's a learning lab for right. this. Exactly. There is a learning lab. There is a YouTube video and uh, there is um, uh, like, like code, like uh, code repository on there. So feel free to try it out. You can use your, uh, like your own uh, specific uh, data and you can replicate it, of course, not only to uh, Cisco uh, Catalyst Center, but also to Meraki uh, and to any, basically any other um, uh, use case, what you have. Right on. So we'll make sure we put that, all of that in the description um, of this video for you stackers. <laughs> Thank you, Flo, for joining us yet again. This was super interesting. It cleared up a lot of the questions I had. Um, there were some light bulb moments definitely here. So uh, Snackers, uh, look for more uh, Gen AI uh, content coming at you over the next few weeks, months, and maybe even years, depending on how it takes off. And thank you again, and see, uh, join us next week for another episode of Snack Minute. Flo, thank you for your time. Thank you, Snackers. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.